Thank you. So here at Trainline, our um, so yes, here's the thing I was going to run through today. So we'll uh, be talking a bit about our use of big data, and uh, I'm going to talk first of all about our uh, technology for that, in particular our, our use of cloud and serverless in the cloud for big data and data science. Then Marco will talk a bit more about some of the data science products that we've uh, developed. And so at Trainline, our mission is to help our customers to make smarter journeys. And that means helping them save uh, time, money, and energy. And we're big believers that data can play a big part in that. And uh, the other thing I'd like you to pick up on here, we've got some facts and figures about Trainline, is that we're a pretty big e-commerce company. We have a lot of uh, uh, visitors, a lot of hits to our sites and, and, and commercial transactions. And this means that with our customers' permission, we have the opportunity to analyze and find patterns in a great deal of data. And we believe that finding patterns in that data, we can make data products that will make train travel uh, nicer for our customers. So uh, we've got a great deal of uh, data, and uh, obviously we're going to need a huge uh, computer to process this all on. And you know, certainly back in the uh, 1980s when I was a student, and there I am actually, there I was a student back in the 80s. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you would have needed a massive computer to, uh, to work with data. Something like this. This is a computer from my student days, Cray Supercomputer. Um, personally, I love the aesthetic of a computer that's so big you can use it as a practical piece of furniture. <laughs> but uh, obviously this thing was very expensive, very exotic, very few people had access to it. And things have moved on. So now we have uh, the modern era and we have uh, racks of... Uh, relatively inexpensive commodity hardware, this kind of thing. And uh, the software that we use to do big data at Trainline, and more widely, as you know, is things like Hadoop, open source software that works very well on this kind of commodity uh, servers, racks of commodity servers. And, uh, and we, that's the stuff that we use. And it sort of moves on from there as well, because we now move into uh, the cloud era as well. And uh, at Trainline, we use Amazon Web Services as our, as our cloud provider both for our, our apps and websites, but also for big data. Works extremely well for us. Um, I actually think that big data, data science, and cloud are a, are a really good pattern and a really good match for each other. And something that we routinely do is start up clusters of 20 or 30 um, EC2 instances on Amazon, uh, process some data, analyze it, save the results to S3, which is Amazon's um, object store, and then we shut down those, uh, those on-demand instances, stop paying money. It's a really good pattern for us. Um, and you know, at times, uh, and certainly in the past, I've run um, uh, Hadoop clusters of hundreds of instances. It's, it's absolutely excellent. Um, this guy is uh, Bob Harris, who is my old CTO at uh, Channel 4. And you know, when you're looking at different cloud options, uh, I'd really advise you to, to think about what, uh, you know, what we call Bob's Laws. Um, which is to say that it's only cloud if it's self-provisioning, pay-as-you-go, and to all intents and purposes, uh, infinitely scalable. And so, you know, this means, is hosting cloud? Not really, because it's not self-provisioning. You have to, uh, it's not pay-as-you-go, you usually have to get locked into a contract. Is enterprise cloud uh, real cloud? Well, it's debatable, isn't it? Is it really um, infinitely scalable? It's a bit debatable. So, you know, if uh, my top tip for you there is to think about Bob's laws. Um, and it moves on as well. So, you know, this idea of uh, pets, et cetera, is something that, uh, is, these are terms that Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, has coined. And, you know, again, I think this is a progress that we're all seeing as well. So there was a time when we treated servers like pets. We used to give them names. And if they weren't very well, we'd sort of lavish time on trying to sort them out, repairing them and what have you. We're now doing a lot of our work in virtual machines on Amazon, that's EC2 instances. And that means that if they're not working correctly, we just kill them off and create another one. It's quite brutal, but it saves a lot of time and uh, means we're not doing a lot of systems admin stuff. And the progress moves on. You know, now, uh, and I'm going to be talking about this a lot in the rest of this talk, we're now moving on to... Uh, what Werner calls herds of computers, so containers and, and serverless architecture. And uh, this also links up with the, the sort of traditional um, hierarchy of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And, you know, I, I want us to sort of think about these two things together. And, you know, a train line, our preference is to go for platform as a service wherever possible, and also to go serverless wherever possible. And we do this because we think it saves a lot of time and money, and the TCO is, uh, works out really well. Um, and it means we can just get on with actually doing the tasks in hand. Uh, but we're not precious about this stuff. So, 
If we find out that the PaaS service isn't powerful enough, doesn't meet our needs, then we'll revert back to infrastructure as a service and install some software on it. Similarly with serverless, we'll go back to, um, to single servers again. So let me take you now through um, some architecture that we have for big data. So it's a very high level view of uh, how we process data. It comes from many sources through a data gateway, ultimately process into a data lake, which in our case is uh, S3 storage on Amazon. I'm gonna expand now into that uh, data gateway and tell you a bit more about it. So we've made our data gateway out of uh, serverless, uh, mostly PaaS services. So we take data via a REST API, we're using API gateway. Uh, we then do some pre-processing of it using Lambda, which is a, um, is a serverless uh, general purpose compute resource on Amazon. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. The data then goes into Kinesis Streams, which is a uh, streaming service, again, platform as a service and serverless on Amazon, somewhat similar to Kafka, if any of you have uh, come across that before. And then when people consume the data, we kind of do the opposite thing. So we use API Gateway and then Lambda again to decompress and uh, decrypt it and so forth. Uh, I can give you an example of how we use this. So uh, we've written another service in Lambda called Glutton, and it reads data from our uh, data gateway using that REST API that I mentioned earlier and uh, outputs it to uh, S3 storage. And so we have a really nice thing here where um, services around uh, train line can put data into the, um, that can be producing services, put it into our data gateway and the data is available to other people who want to, it's like a published subscribe model, but also the data gets persisted into S3 using that glutton uh, thing that I mentioned there. Uh, another example of this kind of serverless approach is our data platform itself. So this is data products um, that we've developed. Marco will be telling you more about those in a moment. And again, very similar sort of pattern. Um, we, at the bottom here, we um, train uh, our models using Elastic MapReduce mostly, sometimes R as well. Store the models uh, on uh, DynamoDB, which is a serverless NoSQL database that Amazon have. And then we have Lambda and API Gateway again to provide those, uh, those data products, um, things like BusyBot and so forth uh, via a REST API to other parts of Trainline. So let me now zoom in a bit on these, uh, these, some of these serverless things that I was talking about. Uh, Lambda, um, if you haven't tried it yet and you're using Amazon, I think it's really great. I think it works really well. Uh, it gives you the ability to concentrate on making some code and then deploying it on what is presumably at Amazon an enormous number of servers, an enormous Lambda farm that they have, and then basically forget about it. They, they do all of the uh, administration of running and scaling of that for you. And uh, so I can tell you, for example, that we have some uh, functions we've written, deployed them on Lambda, and that during busy times, they scale up to what seems to be several hundred instances of little Lambda machines running, running these things. And then in the quiet times, it scales all the way down to virtually zero. And of course, you only pay for what you're using. So it's uh, incredibly cost effective and really easy to use, nothing to administrate really. Um, so generally very excellent. A few things to bear in mind though. One is that um, because Amazon are starting and stopping these things for you, you need to be aware of the warm-up time for your lambdas. So how quickly they get started will, will be depending on uh, the language and framework that you write them in. So we've written some using uh, Java and the JVM takes maybe about five seconds to get started, which you know is in terms of an API uh, response, that's quite a lot of time. On the other hand, when we've written them using Python, it's a much smaller framework and they start up in just a few hundred milliseconds. So be aware of warm up time. Um, also be aware that Lambda is intended for little functions that get started, do something and then shut down. And when they shut down, the Lambda machine freezes. So uh, you can't, the consequence of this we find is that you can't sort of start other threads and expect them to carry on uh, running after the main thread stops. So things like doing monitoring, calling, we, we use uh, New Relic for application monitoring at the moment. So things like calling that on a separate thread don't really work out. So you have to sort of engineer ways around this. But uh, well, by the way, we have a blog post uh, that explains this much better than I can uh, standing here this evening. So by means Google that if you'd like more info about, about our sort of Lambda findings. Um, Kinesis Streams, again, it's excellent. Uh, really easy to get started with. Again, presumably Amazon have an enormous number of servers and things running it for you. Once you set up a Kinesis stream though, all you have to worry about is putting data into it, reading it out again, 
basically everything is administrated for you, very low uh, total cost of ownership, really easy to live with. Um, uh, generally inexpensive to live with you just have to be very aware of what the costing model is and it's basically a combination of the capacity you need how many messages you're going to do how big the messages are and so forth um, if it's important to you that no messages get lost then you probably have to engineer some other things around it to to ensure that um, like all of the Amazon services it comes with CloudWatch but we find that wasn't we found that wasn't enough on its own so we had to engineer extra bits and there may be a case for kind of compressing and encrypting uh, your data before it goes into Kinesis streams compressing it makes it smaller which is cheaper and uh, encryption may have its own benefits something you have to work out for yourself so in general actually when you're using these serverless uh, things or anything on Amazon web services I really advise that you look at this, uh, this 75 page uh, paper that they have about security. I think it's essential reading I and mean, it's very boring reading but really essential if you're using Amazon. Um, so that's it for me, that's it for the, uh, the data engineering part. I'll hand over to Marco now to, to tell you uh, how we use this in practice for actual products. Okay, over to you. All right, thank you John for the nice introduction of uh, our infrastructure. So I'm going to speak about BusyBot as a first uh, um, case study uh, or a first data product or how, what we deploy on this um, uh, infrastructure. So let's start for, from the problem. We all know that uh, train journeys are not always pleasant. So uh, there could be different problems. So from uh, this survey, it was found that the main problems are delays, uh, toilet facilities, uh, value for money. But among these, there's also overcrowding, which is a uh, a uh, very annoying problem when you get on a train, you cannot find a seat, but maybe there is a seat at the other end of the train. So what happened was that uh, last year, November, there was this uh, ACT train, which is an hackathon, but basically happens on a, on a train while the train is moving. And there are, no, it's true. And uh, there, are, the, um, there were like 120 Railtech innovators, and it lasted for two days. And some of our uh, people went to this uh, hackathon, in particular one of them, Raul, which I don't think is here today, but yeah. Um, he worked with a team to deploy the first uh, uh, version of BusyBot. And the idea was so good that they actually won the second prize at this uh, hackathon. And when we, he came back uh, to, to Trainline, the business was so excited, so we, we put some uh, resources in it and we deployed the first version of BusyBot. And the per first version of BusyBot that was deployed in February 2016 was actually just a, a little survey that pops up from the bottom of your uh, screen on, uh, on the Trainline app when, uh, when you're looking at your journey. So when you are in the live tracker and you're looking at your specific journey at the different station, there is this uh, survey that pops up and asks you if you found, find, found a seat or not. And uh, also in which um, side of the train you are, if you are in the back, in the middle, or in the front. So uh, this was deployed only on Android, and uh, the incredible thing is that in three months uh, we collected around 100,000 feedbacks, and that's quite incredible because we, we weren't giving anything back to the user, so we were just asking for this feedback, and, and that's it. But they were happy to share it with us. Um, so yeah, we were able to collect um, around 100,000 feedbacks, and then uh, in the data science team, uh, we started to, to look at this data and we started one of these, um, what we call data discovery um, stage process, where we actually look into the data and basically try to find some insights or uh, uh, some opportunities that uh, we can then share with the business. So what we did was basically to, to build a little dashboard that uh, was showing, for instance, for some particular routes, uh, what, are the, what were the stations uh, among, um, along the route, and which was the percentage of people who were getting a seat uh, in the station in the different parts of the train. And we were also able to um, plot some nice heat maps uh, uh, to show uh, in which days of the week and uh, which part of the days it was easier to get a seat. So um, this was uh, basically our way to communicate uh, the findings, that, mm, that the insights that we got from the data to the business and, and the business was really excited about what we can do with this data and so uh, they, we invested more resources to actually deploy 
um, to, to de de develop the first version of uh, BusyBot. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, how this uh, um, is contextualizing what John said. So uh, we basically start from the feedback collection. So from the, our app, we collect the feedback like a store in a, a DynamoDB production database. And then we have a, a daily process, which is part of the data gate with the John described. That basically gets this data and enrich it with uh, reference data about trains uh, and um, and routes and stations, and uh, put it on a spree. So at this point, the data is still at individual level. So you have uh, uh, the individual feedbacks for every customer, for every user, and uh, you have uh, basically in which part of the train they they boarded and uh, uh, if they found a seat or not. So uh, in this way, we, we are collecting now around 10 to 20,000 feedbacks every day. And if we look at the hourly patterns, you can see this like typical uh, shape. So uh, you can see that these are basically days of the week. And you have the first one, which is a Friday with a huge spike on Friday evening, because probably a lot of people are going home. So they were checking uh, uh, on, on our app their train. And then you have on Saturday, which is a little uh, slow. Uh, and then uh, on Sunday evening, another peak, probably because people are going back to the city for, for a new week, for starting a new week. And then you have a typical shape for weekdays where you have spikes, basically, in the morning and, and in the evening. And if we look at the geographical distribution of these feedbacks, you can see that basically we can cover pretty much all the UK um, if we consider all the feed feedbacks that we collected. But of course, uh, it's not enough to have like one or two feedbacks from a station to be able to uh, tell something to our, uh, to our users. So uh, we need to put some filters to, um, to, to uh, let's say, keep only the station where we have uh, uh, a certain amount of feedback. So, but even if, if you filter from station with at least 100 or 1,000 feedbacks, you still have a, a good coverage. And in particular, one of the worst stations uh, appears to be City Thameslink, close by, quite close by, where the percentage of getting a seat is only 50% overall, overall trains, overall uh, times, overall days. So, um, so what do we do with data that we collected? Um, so we have a first uh, model building and validation project, which, um, process, which is part of a data platform that John described. So we are basically uh, getting the individual feedbacks and aggregating them at uh, uh, different granularity levels. So the one that you can see in this slide is basically a granularity level of uh, route, so origin and destination, and then at uh, the stop, at the station level, and the part of the train. So for this uh, granularity level, we can get uh, uh, the percentage of people who got a seat. And we can use the, this uh, information to actually uh, communicate with the client, with, uh, with the app, and to, to basically say which is the best part um, to where, where you should board the train. Uh, we decided to pre-process all this information to basically um, Mm, um, to, to uh, have a quicker service that can respond to um, all the calls uh, on time. Um, so basically the, the service, all, all, all of what uh, the service has to do is to uh, look up in this table that was pre-processed and basically recommend which part of the train is the best to board. So I mentioned uh, that we also have a data validation uh, step. And in this data validation step, we uh, filter out uh, uh, data points that are noisy or like that are not really re reliable. And the way we are doing it is to basically put some um, filters in place, like we want a certain amount of feedbacks. Uh, we want feedbacks for a certain uh, number of days. And also we want a at least a certain confidence interval around the percentage of people who got a seat. And for instance, in this, uh, in this plot, you can see um, different data points about uh, different uh, um, stations and uh, on, on particular routes. 
And on the X, you can see the percentage of people who got a seat from zero to one. And on the Y axis, you can see the confidence interval. So basically, we are dropping all the data points above, above the line because they're too noisy and the confidence interval is too wide, while we are keeping all these data points below, um, which are also the one, as you can see from the color, with the uh, higher number of feedbacks. So the result of this is basically BusyBot version one that was uh, um, deployed in uh, September, like two months ago. And it actually comes in two flavors, but one is in production, one not yet. So the one in production is the one on the right, where you are on the uh, live tracker and you're looking at your train. And you can see this little picture that tells you which is the part of the train with uh, three seats. And the other one instead uh, is in the journey results. So if you look for a specific journey, uh, you will see all the different trains that you can get, and some of them are marked as busy. So this could be very useful because maybe uh, you're going to the station and you, sp you, you can see that the next uh, train is very busy, so you can, I don't know, relax a little bit and get the, the next one, uh, which could have a seat for you. So, um, BusyBot is definitely not the only thing that we are doing. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting uh, projects and uh, initiatives. So one of them is about hotels. Uh, we have a partnership with Booking.com and basically after you book a ticket uh, with us, uh, we also um, can help you to book a hotel through Booking.com. Uh, what we are doing is to basically uh, analyze the, the, this data and try to uh, understand who are the customers who are more likely to book hotels based on the journey they're taking and also based on what they did in the past. Uh, so we built a propensity model that takes this data into account, um, select the most likely customers and the most likely train bookings, and then send this data to, to the uh, to our CRM team that can then contact them and try to uh, sell a hotel. Um, another work that we are doing with the CRM team is uh, around uh, uh, journey recommendations. So um, we have a monthly newsletter that we send uh, to our customer. And in this uh, uh, monthly newsletter, we have uh, some uh, recommendations about journeys that you may like based on what you did in the past. And so we are uh, looking at your past uh, purchases and past behavior uh, to try to recommend you the best uh, um, journeys that you can take in future. And uh, finally, this is very recent, we are also trying to uh, predict what you're going to search, so as, especially in the app. So um, when you open the app and you maybe want to uh, check times because uh, maybe you're a commuter, so it's uh, early morning, uh, you want to check your train, if it's on time or not, you usually have to uh, put origin destination. So what we are trying to do is to look at your uh, patterns, at your data that you, you gave us uh, using the app to uh, predict this search uh, so you can already find the, this, field, this field field for you and you don't have to fill it. And in the evening, when uh, given um, uh, the model should be able to predict that you are coming home and, uh, and so it should already predict you the, the right origin destination to search for. So um, to summarize uh, our talks, um, so John presented how we can basically build our architecture using uh, serverless uh, tools that are very useful for uh, uh, this kind of projects and initiatives that we are, um, we are tackling. And in particular, we can see that most of the things that we are doing follow very similar patterns. So it's very important to get it right so you can then uh, um, replicate it to like, solve different problems. Uh, I spoke about BusyBot, I spoke about uh, hotels, recommendation, hotels, journey recommendations, and uh, search prediction, but there are many other things that we are doing about uh, delays, about prices, about uh, uh, personalization and real-time information. So I'm going to finish by saying that we are hiring, so if you're looking 
for a data scientist or data engineer position, please get in touch with uh, our HR people. So there is uh, Mali over there, and David, I don't know if he's in the room, probably not, but you have their contact there, or you can get in touch with me or the other train line guys in the room.